Well, good evening, everybody. Thanks for thanks for joining us tonight. It's the it's the March 6th Town Council Finance Committee meeting, and I'd like to change the agenda just a little bit and maybe offer. I know we offer public comment at the very end of the meeting, but that means everybody has to sit through two hours of our exciting conversations. I didn't know if anybody wanted to have any public comment they wanted to lead with. If so, this would be a great time to come up if anybody has anything. No, I guess not. So I guess we'll, we'll call to order. Um, and we know who's present, so I think we're, we're fine. Um, the next item, item three, is really the approval of the minutes of January 12th. Um, so moved. Second. All those in favor? Then I think the fourth item on the ag agenda is, I think you were going to come back, uh, Larissa, with some recommendations for metrics we may want to consider and do. It looks like you've done a ton of work, so Great. look forward to your conversation. Um, so, yeah. Our heads the, um, yeah, you're pleased to come down and sit here if it's more comfortable for you. So as you directed, I went through, and um, at the top of each page, you'll see my little color coding there. As you're looking through the metrics, you'll see a narrative box under each set. Um, I've broken them down, tables, graphs, and then a, a narrative section. If the narrative section, like in this one regarding population, is gray, it means that there's not a clear positive or negative takeaway. There are, just, there are definitely questions that have, need to be asked. Um, I've provided you with some answers to those questions, um, and really it's up to you to decide um, how you wish to proceed. Um, if you see a green box, which you will on the next uh, tab, that means that this is a metric that I think is really trending in a very positive direction and that you should feel good about what's happening there. If there's a yellow box, it means um, this is not a danger zone, but it's certainly an area to keep an eye on and it could potentially become an issue in the future if, depending on policy decisions. There are no red boxes, I'm pleased to report, um, but were something to suddenly go very poorly, you would see a red box as a warning. Um, I don't know how you'd like me to proceed, if you would like me to take you through the analysis that I've done, if you want to just kind of have that there for your own use later, what would you like? I might suggest uh, there were a few graphs that Larissa's added in that we can key on mostly as we get deeper in the presentation, but for this first one, okay. why don't you just uh, quickly focus on uh, the, the commentary. And this is a piece that we really want your input. This is uh, Larissa's first take with some of my input, and we see this as the makings, the beginnings of this dashboarding. Uh, perhaps we can reflect it in a different way, but this is the first pass at that. So is that, does that please the committee if we just yeah. kind of give yeah. some quick commentary? And okay. Yeah. If sure. I could ask, uh, Liz, yeah. if you could include as part of that um, why you may have selected the color that's in there, so why this would be gray versus a green. Yeah, so at the, the, within each box, the very first line, it will tell you um, why that color is there. So this oh, okay. um, population okay. data does not provide a clear positive or a negative trend. It, um, it just kind of is. So the one thing that I really want to keep highlighting, though, is this graph that you'll see on the right with the percentage of population below 18 and above 65. Again, just want to call to your attention that even though the population of Scarborough is increasing across the board, the population that is under the age of 18 is consistently becoming a smaller and smaller percentage of our population, and the population above 65 is an increasingly larger percentage of the population, mm -hmm. and that is further reflected by the median age continuing to rise. So that's neither good nor bad, but it certainly may change the policy decisions that the council wishes to make moving forward um, over time. It also may change the kind of the makeup of that basket of goods that we could, you know, we're you, a service provider. We think of our services in the town, you can think of it as a basket of goods. That basket of goods may need to shift and change. Um, it may become more and more of a priority to have a senior center, for instance. It may become um, more difficult to communicate directly regarding school budgets, that um, depending on where people are in their lives, they may have different priorities, um, and so there may be some more targeted outreach that may be needed um, for better understanding across the demographics. And one of the things to really be aware of is that when those lines either become parallel or, as we've seen a lot of the state of Maine, cross 
and we suddenly have a larger percentage of the population over 65, you're really in a very different place than you were in 2000. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, I just, I'm just curious to know, so we've got below 18 and 65, what is the total percentage of the population that this breaks out to? So is there, is there like, uh, you know, 40% uh, of the population is, is 20 to 40 or something like that? So I can break that down for you further if you'd like. Um, so that we, just briefly, it looks to me about 18% is over 65 and about 22% is um, under 18. So that makes 40%. So that leaves you with 60% of the population between 18 and 65. Yeah. And I think this, doesn't the census break out by certain... It does. So I can, I'm happy yeah. to add those bars if you'd like to see. Yeah, that would be happy good. to do so. Well, if I could suggest it. Um, Sometimes too much information um, is nice to know, but not. I think if we could identify what is the largest population between that, those two points. Um, so I don't need to see every breakdown that's provided, but what is the largest? So um, is it 30 to 40? Is it 25? You see what I'm saying? I do. Because that's the, otherwise you're going to have a very large graph that has a lot, too many. So bars. what I think I would prefer to do, gentlemen, is I would like to leave this one as it is, so because I think that that, Shift is what I'm most interested in from a policymaking standpoint, but I'd be very happy to um, supply a third graph that's going to just yes. show those population breakdowns for just 2015's numbers, and then we can compare from that point on if that works for you. Does that, does that satisfy both of your needs, or is it not satisfy either of your needs? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, it's fine. I just, my, my only, again, my only point of bringing that up is I don't want, I don't want to be setting policy on two extremes. Under 18 and over 65. I agree. There's a large population in the middle there that we have to identify and address as well. I think it's very, to your point, first, I think it's, uh, first, I think it's extremely important to know what that's trending and how it's trending, but there's still a very large population in the middle that, that is in between there, too. Sure. Great. <coughs> question I had, and I think you mentioned it, and it makes it too busy, probably, but did you say this kind of mirrors what's happening in the state, or is this unique to? There. This definitely mirrors what's happening in the state. One of the things that I thought was interesting, um, <coughs> I ran some of these graphs by uh, Kate Dufour. She's one of the um, people from the MMA. She was surprised that this was happening in Scarborough. She's like, even Scarborough is not protected from the aging of Maine. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Maine is aging across the state. And yeah. I think that there is some sense that because of our close proximity to Portland that we would be protected a little bit from that trend, mm. but this shows that we are not as protected as we might think that we were, and something to just kind of watch moving forward. And something that also will be really interesting to see, um, should new housing opportunities and options come into the town, how does that cause this graph to shift, or does it cause it to shift? If Are we equally attracting both um, young families and, and maybe empty nesters and early retirees? Yeah. I can't uh, attribute the source. Uh, <coughs> I've heard anecdotally that actually our average median age, um, our median age is one of the highest in the state. So I, I, it'll be interesting to kind of compare us statewide. Yeah, so, so that's why I know how it works in, and maybe that's all we need is just, just what the yeah. state yep. median age is, just so we can kind of see are, yep. we, are we moving, you know, in lockstep or, or not, especially as we look at the growth that's going to happen in the next. That's great. Sure. So then moving down here, we're talking about income again. Um, so again, it's a gray box, neither positive nor negative. Um, I ask you to think about that mean and median income are indicators of ability to pay. That the reason that these are included and why we want to kind of track those over time is that we want to know um, what are the residents' ability to pay. I encourage you to, in all kind of ability to pay conversations to make sure that we're using median household income as opposed to mean because I think that median is better reflective of the population, that your reason you're seeing such a great, a great difference between those two values is that we have some extremely wealthy households in the community that are skewing our mean to the wealthier end mm -hmm. and that those should not be perhaps, those may not be the best um, households to base policy decisions on. Um, I also, uh, in this kind of gray section, highlight that the median household income for Cumberland County is $60,051 per year as of 2015. So we are well above mm -hmm. the median household income. And a reminder that Cumberland County has the highest median income of all counties in Maine. Just for clarification for the, for the audience for at home, could you define median versus mean? Sure. So 
going back to your high school okay. stats, you have mean, median, and mode. Um, your mean is your average. It's if you've got five numbers, you add them together, divide by five, you get the mean. Your median is if you have those five numbers and you line them up in advancing order, the number that is in the middle is your median. And if you have five numbers and you figure out which one appears the most frequently, that would be your mode. I've left census data does not provide me with mode and it's not all that, it would be actually quite useful, but we don't have it. I tried to um, gain it from our assessing data a little bit as far as like a mode for the um, housing value and the way that our data is stored, I'm not able to access that. But um, so that's your, your reminding of how that works. Okay. Is there any possibility if we adopt this as a metric that <coughs> at least for the, the median that you want us to pay attention to, what so these are all in 2016 dollars, right? D yep. What that actual rate of increase is, because we hear about that a lot, saying people's incomes are going up at X, but right. taxes are going up at either X or X plus something. Right. That might give us a good good feel. We sure. Can do it. We can do it. I mean, the blue lines look pretty flat. The blue lines are fairly flat. There, um, I do highlight to you in the in the gray box there that we actually see a very slight decrease in median household income from 2000 to 2015. So that's really, those are, 2000 is solid pre-recession values. And again, that may be that shift of demographic. As you see a larger percentage of your population coming in over the age of 65, fixed they're on fixed income. Yeah. And so <coughs> you're going to, um, I think it changes the narrative a little bit. I think that we think of Scarborough as an increasingly wealthy town, and I think in a lot of ways that is a true narrative. But these values, these figures suggest that there's more to that story, that we are certainly seeing perhaps some extreme wealth coming in. We have an ideal location to live, but that there is also um, people that are not quite as wealthy that are coming in. So that's what that gray is really talking about. Um, any other questions regarding these? So I only heard part of uh, what Peter said. I think that, so I think you're hitting it right on the nose. Um, and the reason why it's gray is that it, these two data points that we just talked about, it's about what you compare this against. Because by itself it tells you a little story but not a whole lot. So, you know, I think if I heard part of what Peter said, it's then what do you then compare this to? Um, tax rate increases, do you compare it to other, you know, what other metrics would you then use? Um, and that's where it can skew, like in anybody's own personal opinion, because I could pick different data than you would pick to compare to make an argument. Mm -hmm. So. Um, We're going to make some of those arguments on the next page. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, oh, yeah, I agree. It's, it's, it is. It, it's that's why policy making is kind of exciting, because there's so many different ways to go. But even, I mean, just to say very precise, just, <coughs> just showing that, my assumption was that the incomes in Scarborough were increasing. Not necessarily. So that's as a policymaker, that's just interesting. That it's, it's really kind of that flat line. So that's yeah, it's neat. That's a great metric. Yeah. So I've broken down. So we're um, just kind of in general fiscal health metrics. I've broken them down. Um, you'll see debt, debt service, those little tabs at the top. All of the tables now. I've brought everything into um, uh, 2017 dollars, it's alongside the dollars that were recorded in our audit statements. So you can see how they trend um, accounting for inflation, inflation over time. So these are all about debt. Um, I think people should be pleased to see a green box here, and I feel I can, st strong, I can stand firmly in my assessment of that green box. Um, I highlight for you that all of our debt um, figures are really showing a very positive trend. We have. If you look at that first one, that debt in 2017 dollars, I want to highlight that those blue bars are the municipal debt, orange bars are school debt, and gray bars are total debt. Those are all in uh, inflation-adjusted dollars. You can see that the town-held debt is very, very flat, and that the school-held debt takes a jump when the Wentworth School comes on, but remains flat and actually is, is very slightly yeah. decreasing there. So I think that that is a, is a positive sign. Um, this one is the one that I'm, oh, um, so total debt as a percentage of full state valuation. This graph is going to lead us to a lot more questions. Um, if you'll notice, those blue bars are the full state valuation as reported by the state of Maine in 2017 dollars. This graph 
caused a good solid two weeks of conversation and work. Um, it is completely contrary to the narrative that I think we have held. Okay, so it, when we account for inflation, the town of Scarborough was just like so many other communities, really uh, truly affected by the recession. And um, the positive sign out of this graph, is, I would like you to see, is the rebound that's taking place. And most importantly is that orange line that's total debt as percentage of full state valuation, and it is on its way down. And not only is it on its way down, which we like to see, but I want to highlight to you that um, the credit industry warning benchmark for net debt as a percentage of full valuation is when that exceeds 10%. And as you can see on this graph, we are hovering below 3%. So that's a really positive assessment of our debt to value ratio. And I know that that's a, a conversation um, of whether or not Scarborough has taken on too much debt. I would really feel good about saying the answer to that is no, that the, st the strategy of taking on debt when interest rates were extremely low to maintain infrastructure is going to serve this town very well as we're moving forward. Quick, quick question on your, on your total debt numbers. Yes. Um, and Tom, maybe you can you can mm -hmm. help me with this one a little bit too. Are these the same valuation numbers that they're using for EPS money? The full state valuation, the second yes. column. Yes. They are. Uh, so can you scroll to your graph? Um, oh, sorry, is that one right there? Uh, is that full state valuation? That's full state valuation in 2017 dollars. Yep. So. Okay, so then I the guess... The state formula is not that sophisticated, though. If you go up to that top sheet, they're just looking at column two there. Right. They're so looking at this <laughs> column right here. This column right here. And that's the narrative that Larissa spoke to, is, is that we're, you know, the conventional wisdom is, is that we're gaining year over year. When adjusted for inflation, it, it shows a bit of a different scene. I, I guess what I'm, what I'm trying to get to the bottom of is, is we've been, we've been informed many times by the state that our valuation continues to hold and improve. And that's why we're consistently losing money in EPS funding again every year consistently. I mean, we're not talking like a little bit. Most importantly, that's, that's true, and it, it's right. borne out right in this column. Mm -hmm. um, Starting in 2011, it's... And most importantly, those gains compared to everyone else in the state is really the thing that makes the difference for us. We're not only gaining, but we're outperforming by a significant measure. Uh, I think if you were to do these graphs for many, many other main communities, you would see a much more precipitous saddle there. And with that segue, I'm going to actually take a one quick break and shift tabs, because I have. <laughs> so when we come over this graph right here, imagine that blue line graph as a line, as, instead of a bar graph, as a line graph, so that each of these lies is representing the, the trajectory of those bars. We are the yellow above. I've chosen Falmouth, um, Biddeford, Cumberland, Falmouth, Wyndham, and Yarmouth as comparisons to see how other towns assess values when brought with inflation reacted. Um, Biddeford is that second line, that blue line right below ours. You can see that it's still kind of in a downward trend. It's just barely started to the level off. one that's the 8 and a half by 14. Tab three, second right page. Hmm. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry, it's not there. <coughs> um, tab three. Take? So the um, Falmouth is the gray line. They're recovering nicely. And what I've done for you down here is show you the percent difference in full state valuation between 07 and 15. Ours is the smallest of those bars, mm -hmm. which shows that the part of the narrative about Scarborough being somewhat resilient against the recession was true. Our recovery time has been shorter and our bounce back has been higher. Mm -hmm. So when they're working out the state aid formula, the other communities were having the same, the same experience, but their trough was lower and they haven't come back yet. So we are rebounding faster than our neighbors. Um, I didn't take it for all of the, um, all of the communities in Cumberland County, that seems like a lot of, of number crunching for not necessarily a whole lot of gain. But I chose um, Falmouth and Yarmouth because they come from the school's aspiration comparison mm -hmm. page. I chose Wyndham because they match us as far as our rate of growth is concerned, so I wanted to see how um, a booming community we compared with that. 
Um, Cumberland also is a, both a, a growing community and an aspirations community. And Biddeford, I do love the city of Biddeford, but I wanted to really highlight how bad it could have been and um, kind of get some perspective of a, a nearby neighbor. And Yarmouth has a great chart. And Yarmouth has some unique things with Cousins Island. They have a, a big taxpayer of the power plant there. So that's a bit of an outlier just because of the uniqueness. But and I, Larissa and I were really going back and forth about this, and it was I was comforted because I was kind of fighting back against her when you convert it to $2,017. It kind of blew everything that I had <laughs> out of the water. And so it was just... I would say it's comforting, but it made more sense when we were able to overlay, you know, on a chart show how other communities performed and actually see a very similar curve. And, mm -hmm. and thankfully, C. Scarborough performing. Really bouncing back nicely. So I've asked you, I've said, you know, this is a positive trend, but um, that doesn't mean that we don't have some questions to ask. Uh, so is the valuation or population decrease, when we're looking at that, that orange line, okay, mm -hmm. so it's a ratio. So that means that it's made up of two figures, are we seeing a decrease because our valuation is going up? Are we seeing, um, uh, why do I say population? I don't think mm. I wanted to say population. Um, or because our debt is decreasing. Mm. And the answer in this case is um, really more about the valuation going up. Is the debt load increasing and why? Are we becoming more reliant on long-term debt to finance capital projects? How much additional debt will we need to have in the next five to ten years? <coughs> Are we using debt to fund our operations budget? The answer is no. Um, is the increase a trend or does it reflect a one-time capital project like a new building? So just questions to be asked um, and you guys are the ones, of course, to answer those. But I think it's a, I think it's a very positive sign that the debt numbers, I think, are, are actually a real strength. Um, so the other warning, uh, benchmark warning, sort of from the, the uh, credit industry, is if they see overall net debt as a percentage of valuation increasing 50% over the amount from four years earlier, our largest four-year increase is 0.72%. Mm. So that's another reason that this yeah. got a green box. Mm. So I would suggest that that's actually because of both. We've been uh, very good stewards regarding adding additional debt, and at the same time, I mean, it, yes, we have been adding debt, but it's just smaller than it had been historically, and also because of the increased valuation. You know, a, d a dashboard may be, listen, if you just go back up to the chart there, uh, the warning is if we go above. 10%. Like, yeah. Or it could be something lower. If oh, yeah. Depend depending on comfort level, if it goes above 4%, maybe this group, you know, the warning flag goes up. Right. Uh, or 3%. 3%. But those are discussion points that we look for feedback from you on. I mean, if you look, if you look at the debt service, municipal side of the debt service in 2013, we had 4.9 million, 4.942. Today we have 4.923, and on the school debt side, in today's dollars, it's only gone, it's gone down by six. I don't know, is that twenty thousand dollars? So when you look over time, have there, you know, did we? That's a great position to be after four years. Yeah. Well, what we strive to do from a budget point of view is, is to is to remove the peaks and valleys, is to keep your debt service as consistent uh, year over year and thereby not having great fluctuations. Debt service can be the tail that wags the dog. It can really affect your tax rate. So we've tried to stay as level as we can in terms of annual debt service costs. The other thing I'd point out is that I think a lot of other communities have deferred their maintenance. What we've been able to do, yes, we're carrying a higher debt load than many of our uh, comparison communities, but frankly, they're not taking care of their needs. And at some point, that cost will catch up to them. And at a much higher interest rate. Right. The problems don't go away. They just get more expensive. So then we move into debt service. Um, and this table is kind of a monster. I'm sorry about that. Uh, but I needed to have all of those figures, and I wanted you to be able to see where they came from. Um, so the debt service analysis is a yellow um, box. And what that means is that I wouldn't say that there's anything bad or something to be warning about in here, but there's definitely... Um, some things to consider and just, okay, so again, that orange line is exactly what we want to see. That is debt service payments as a percentage of annual revenues. From the credit industry standpoint, we absolutely want to see that number coming down. And um, the, again, the, 
the lines of debt service, they're fairly flattish, and Tom already talked about why that's a, a great thing, and they're also coming down. Um, we want to keep, of course, an eye on debt service because it does limit that town budgeting flexibility. Credit industry standards see debt service as a percentage of re revenues of 20% as a warning sign that the municipality is in financial distress and suggest that 10% or lower is, is desirable. And that's why it's got a yellow box. Mm -hmm. um, we are currently at 11.2%, so we're not quite at that 10% that the credit industry would like us to be, but we are definitely heading in the right direction. So just, sorry, just looking at these again, comparing this to your initial debt in 2017 dollars, if I'm reading this correctly, the municipality side of things has a lower overall debt than the school, but our debt service as a percentage of our budget is higher on the municipal side than it is on the school side. And, it's to and actual dollars is higher because we, have, we hold our debt for a shorter period of time. So instead of a 30-year mortgage, we have a 10. If those bars are broken up between interest and principal, you'll see the lion's share of ours is principal expense as opposed to interest, and it kind of flips uh, for school. It's just a matter of the type of project and the length of time we're financing it. Um, so again, this would be a place that if the council may wish to make some sort of um, policy statements or policy goals regarding having that metric reflect 10% or below and working towards that as a goal. I've charted out for you, um, I highlighted some decreases. Uh, we've decreased 1% since 2005 and 4.3% over the last 10 years. So we're, this is really something to be proud of. It's a positive, but it, it is yellow only because we're not quite where the credit industry mm -hmm. would like us to be ideally. Is, is there, if we are at the 10%, does that impact bond rates and those types of things? Is there, is there a direct I, my discussion with Joe Katara, I think that the more, so what I'm understanding from Joe, and please Tom correct me if I'm misunderstanding, they like to see policy statements that reflect their parameters and that we follow through on. So if the council were to adopt a policy statement such as, you know, we are going to work towards debt service as a percent of revenues equal or below 10%, and if we were to actually achieve that goal and hold it, for two to three years, that provides greater backing for our request for an improvement in our bond rating. How much of that goes how we structure our bonds? Because you said we tend to have shorter payment cycles. If we extend that payment cycle out, our percentage of... Uh, it will. I, I think if there's one thing, uh, based on my meetings with all the credit agencies through the years, it's building fund balance. That's the thing that we're, we take a hit on, and I think that's the single thing we could do um, to possibly get an upgrade in our rating. Remember, we've only got a couple of spots to move to, so it gets increasingly difficult as you get close to the top. Um, but one of the negative comments, and I'm not sure if it directly relates to this or the use of this information in comparison, it was the, fa um, the con was about our debt um, when we got the credit rating agency. Debt per capita. Was it per capita? Uh, That's what capita. I couldn't remember what it, uh, yeah. Yeah, one of the other metrics was, was debt per capita. And we do see that debt per capita has increased. Yes. Um, not surprisingly, uh, again, we're seeing a reflect the school, the municipal debt per capita has remained steady. Um, but the, when the town agrees to take on a large building project for a few years, you're going to see that increase take place. And we're also, as a parallel project, versus working with other communities on a benchmarking project. So it'll be interesting to compare that debt per capita and a number of other statistics across um, other communities. And that rating agencies do like to see shorter debt payments, you know, rather than longer ones. Of course, yeah. Ones. So the question I have is um, on the debt per capita. It seems to me that that would be somewhat of a shortcoming of a statistic only because a significant portion of your debt supports business uh, growth and business, where the debt per capita, you don't get any impact analysis as a result of that. So infrastructure development that you take on as debt, that all supports the business growth that happens. So how do you balance that? So I think we've balanced that a little bit through this graph right here. Evaluation. So that is a percentage yeah. full valuation. Um, I do talk to you a little bit in some of the, the analysis in other graphs below that when given an option, I have chosen to use either full state valuation or town total assessed value as a denominator because it is a better reflection okay. of Scarborough's um, makeup. 
So debt service looking good. Top 10 taxpayers, this is another metric. So these metrics came from um, not just what bond agencies are looking for, but also from some of Peter's requests from the beginning of this process, and then also um, some of the ones that I thought were a good idea out of the ICMA um, fiscal health assessment book. So top 10 taxpayers, this is definitely all about the bond rating agencies. Um, this gets a big old green. If I could make it a neon green, I would. Um, warning line for this would be if 20% of our value was held by the top five taxpayers. Um, I'm not sure what's going on with these boxes. I can't get it to sleep. Um, so this shows us that the top 10 taxpayers are holding only 7.94% of our town's value. Mm -hmm. So we are really a shining star. In, we have a great diverse tax base. If one of our large taxpayers were for some reason to suddenly collapse, would it hurt? Sure, but not nearly as much as a paper mill closure. And they really are quite diverse. If you like, we can give you actually who they are. And it's uh, comforting to see kind of the diversity among that top, top ten. It's everything from big box retail to assisted care living. We've got a project in front of you in a couple of weeks that would be clearly in the top ten that would be, you know, basically commercial venture apartments. So there's comfort associated with the diversity among those top ten as well. So then we're moving into fund balance, everyone's um, favorite to thing to kind of watch a little bit. Uh, we've got another green box here because we are, po we are trending in a very positive direction. Um, again, I'm not sure. Here we go. So fund balance is showing a positive trend. It's showing two metrics. Fund balance is a percent of revenues and fund balance is a percent of expenditure. Not surprising, they're trending in the same direction. Um, and there are no set rules. I can't find anything in the bond rating agency, like nothing that is set that governs the level of fund balance the town should have. Our current fund balance policy requires a minimum of 8.33% of the operating budget and aims for 10% of the same. We do not have a policy regarding the unrestricted fund balance as a percent of revenues and expenditures, but the bond agencies look at these ratios as part of their bond rating assessment. So Joe and I had a conversation about this, Joe Skutara of Moores and Cabot, and he feels that the town should aim to build the unrestricted fund balance as a percent of revenues to 12%, and that if we were to do so and hold it and be able to hold it there for at least three years, he said in his words, we provide excellent support for him to have a bond rating upgrade. So he didn't make a recommendation regarding a percent of expenditures, or is that the same as the 12 on the revenue? He side? said that he wanted to do the revenues. Just revenues only? Yep. See, and I talk a little bit as we go down further about why we want to, that may be um, <coughs> important to the bond agencies, but we're going to want to keep track of that from an expenditure standpoint mm -hmm. just because, uh, or we're going to want to think about expenditures maybe a little bit more than revenues because revenues reflect property taxes coming in. Mm -hmm. And bond agencies just kind of want to make sure that you have the ability to tax, you have the ability to generate revenue in whichever ways you need to do that. Policymakers that are serving the town may wish to consider um, expenditure and other revenue sources outside of property tax as a better determination of ability to pay and willingness to pay. If I recall also in our, this committee's discussion about bond rating and the impact of excessive research when we were talking about the fund balance policy. We really wanted to make sure that we weren't holding too much money uh, in right. reserves and not funding programming and, and, and investments that we need. And then we, I think if I recall, and it, maybe that's one thing we should look at regularly too, is looking at the impact of what that bond rating increase would mean to the, to the, to the interest rates versus what it would cost us in shifting it over, you, you know what I mean, in, in putting 12% of that. So. Yeah, and my recollection is that the rating agencies are most interested in this positive path, obviously, mm -hmm. and the fact that you have a policy and you stick to it. And I think we'll get some points by raising the bar. This count or this past year, <coughs> you bump everything up, kind of two, two points, I think, in each respect. Uh, but now we've got to stay, stay true to it. Well, and I think the, you know, the bigger picture is that looking at the overall town budget, we're at, truly at, minimal receivership, which we should be at stable now at least. <laughs> now we can start looking at, at the predictability of marginal increasing. And if we, my concern is always if, if that's in flux and we never know where we're going to be, that fund balance is in flux also. Yeah. Oh, it has been. That's the go-to right. place. When, right. when there's a hole elsewhere in the budget, you go to fund balance. Right. So, so I think 
that might be a good step to move in a year or two once we stabilize kind of the, the seal the floor, if you will, the cellar. Right. Um, then we can start looking at adjusting. I think it's important to note that when we did have to go below the policy that we had, although the policy was different. We didn't automatically get downgraded. It's whether or not the council that has the fortitude to get back and what was the plan to get back. Because they, I think they do recognize that there's some times that you might have to go below policy to be able to, you know, weather it out like we did was it 2010, was 11. Eight or uh, nine or ten. Yeah. And the council made a very conscious decision right. to use the fund balance to keep the tax rate right. stable. And it was, they knew what they were doing. They thought they needed to be part of the solution, not piling on. Uh, the good news is it worked out. we have climbed steadily each and every year out. Um, just, but just, just kind of looking ahead a little further on the agenda, but I think this year in particular, you know, figuring out that sensitivity to, you know, this increasing trend that we have of increasing the fund balance versus our needs maybe this year and next year to balance the budget will be a really critical sort of factor. So. Anything we get, because we probably won't come back and touch upon this until we're well through the budget process. But I think that's an important piece just to. Well, what we all know to be true is that this number is a bit artificial, right? Yeah, because of the And so that's going to go out as quickly as it came in, essentially. And I think Chris's point is well taken. I think once we get to rock bottom, this minimal receivership, it's going to really smooth out things and give us more predictability going forward. But there's going to be a we're going to see a dip, I, I predict, in 17. But, but I think the question becomes just any way we can get a better handle on it would be, you know, we have reserves now. How much of that do we use this year versus out in time? And how does that sort of doesn't trigger what Sean was describing, that if we all of a sudden see a dip? Does that in, so just, I mean, we don't have to answer it tonight, but just a sure. thought how we do that. But if we can also, uh, if we can explain why things happen, that's helpful to the agencies as yeah. well, that yeah. they're not out of mismanagement, this was known, a year ago, frankly, uh, we also have some tax appeals, uh, some financial exposure that may affect this as well. We'll know that in the next couple of months. Again, something that we can point to and, and, and justify, if you will. Yeah. Data like this also helps balance the discussion because you could have a um, knee-jerk reaction. So given the situation that we're in, you know, um, minimal receivership, we don't also want to go in and use all of our fund balance to, in order to respond to it because all that's going to happen is that this ratio is going to go down right. <laughs> and then you have to do some type of reaction to get back to it and we've always tried to level out our reaction to these type of changes and so have it, this is one of the other good ones I think because um, this is the year that we're going to need this data to not do a knee-jerk reaction. Yeah. And be thoughtful about that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Are we ready this to is go? great work, thank you. This okay. Is so, um, so looking at revenues, and where are they coming from? And what does that mean for us? So there's a kind of a bundle of things right here. Um, started out with this graph right here, total revenues as a percentage of total town assessed value. This was something that I kind of wanted to add in. Um, looks like a really simple little chart, right? Nothing to see here. It's a positive trend. Um, I just need to kind of scoot us down a little bit so I can show you. You get a gray box though. Okay, on this one and a lot of questions. So that first graph, that simple one little line that's showing a positive trend, if we were to just simply go by the ICMA metrics book, we'd say, oh good, that's a green light. But I was curious about where that was coming from and I thought perhaps we shouldn't maybe give, make it green all at once. So first thing I did was I broke out where our revenue sources are coming from. Um, and so the blue line above is property tax, and you can see that since, since 2007, we have seen an increase in the percentage of our revenues that are coming from property tax. Not surprising, there is a corresponding decrease in the yellow line, which is our intergovernmental revenues. We also can see that um, licenses and permits are, are up slightly since 2007. Our excise taxes have almost recovered from the recession, they're, they're coming in and interest was minimal in 2007 and has become even more so um, as time has gone on. So I break those down for you and I make, made this chart. So property tax and non-property tax revenue as a percent of town assessed value. 
And this shows a different story. So that first one that was a slightly increasing line, a uh, bond agency or, or someone is going to say, okay, that's a positive trend. We're happy to see that increase. I broke this out for you so that you could see from, yeah, from a bond agency standpoint, we're doing a great job. I mean, our tax collection rate is outrageously good. It's 99%, 98%, really very high. We have strong ability to pay our bills. But when we break out property tax versus non-property tax revenue as a percent of town assessed value, we can see that the property tax has become a ever-increasing percentage of our revenue and that the non-property tax revenues are actually fairly flat over the last 10 years. And so I ask you a bunch of questions. Um, the, I start off by saying that the general line is positive, but that a positive line still makes us ask some questions. Is it reasonable to assume that our revenues will continue to increase? Are we using new revenues to fund new programming? And if so, do we have faith that these revenues will continue so that we're not offering programs that we're then unable to fund moving forward? Is our increasing revenue as a percentage of assessed value an indicator of future costs? So have our revenues increased as a result of a recent building boom? And that made me nervous, considering what we kind of have going on. So I pulled all of the data for that. I, I pulled the building permit revenues for the time period, and I think we can safely say no, it's not a building boom. Um, in 2007, Scarborough collected $466,000 in building permit revenues, and um, that figure jumped to 502000 in 2008. And when we convert that into current dollars, 2017 dollars, we collected almost $100,000 less in building permit fees in 2016 than we did 10 years ago. So our increase in revenues is not from, it's not a, sh a flash in the pan, quick building boom sort of source that is also not indicative of increasing costs moving forward. Um, do they represent an increase in tax burden? In other words, does the rate of increase match or remain below the rate of increase in median household income? In Scarborough, our demographic graphs show that no, our revenues as a percentage of assessed value is increasing and the median household income is decreasing slightly. We can also see in the table above that the percentage of revenues coming from property taxes has consistently gone up due in large part to the $3.5 million decrease in state revenue sharing and state aid for education. Um, I, I go on to say I don't think that the difference in this metric and our median household income is a point for immediate or high level of concern, but it's an area that you may wish to continue to monitor. Um, and I also suggest that that second one that splits out, um, again, may, you may wish to use that um, to kind of assess the ability or continued willingness to pay. That property tax rates are determined by two factors total expenditure and also total assessed value and that the increasing property tax revenues as a percentage of assessed value reflects Scarborough's increasing tax rate. Since property taxes are extremely regressive, meaning that th those that are the least able to pay are the most deeply affected, council may wish to watch this metric as an indicator. Two, two things, I guess maybe a question first and then a comment. Um, is there a way, I'm sure there is, to calculate the percentage of lost intergovernmental inter revenue compared to the increase in tax rate to see if there's a direct correlation between the two in terms of the model. Absolutely. And the second, more, I guess more of a comment, is that I would be very cautious in looking at the reasons why that property tax increase has come up because I think there are bigger picture extenuating circumstances more importantly than the replacement of lost take funds that are beyond our control. So the question isn't necessarily become, if I'm phrasing, if I'm picturing <coughs> this the right way, it isn't that we're, we're trying to take advantage of a situation uh, to gain more revenue. It's really we've been raising property taxes in order to make up offsets that we've lost to maintain services. We're not, our rates are going up, but it doesn't mean that a corresponding increase in services, like where we've got, now we've got trash pickup, you know, every day at every house. It's because we've had to augment those lost revenues for services. So as our property taxes go up, the, the, the perception is we should be getting more services for that revenue. But in actuality, I believe, and maybe the data won't show this, but I, I think anecdotally we can assume that that's more just to make up for shortfalls in the state money. Not dollar for dollar, but this, there's a direct correlation. I've actually sure. worked out, I think, some of the math you're looking for in the next set of graphs. Okay. 
So in the next set of graphs, if this is already, um, is it possible to, um, when you compare this um, and compare it to other communities, if you were to compare it to other communities, what about um, non-property non -property tax services that are funded by property tax? So we have services such as municipal waste, recycling, trash pickup, that are included, and it's pretty heavy. Um, um, is there an advantage of taking that out? Because one could say you could transfer that as a consumer-based tax and you bill each of the households rather than doing it through the property tax, which has been a, whether it's through... Do you want to your throw? I can put that I'm not the saying, I'm just... <laughs> but the question is, for analysis purposes, you know, does that take into consideration those type of services that are included? Um, is that, does that come so later, maybe? I can run those numbers for you, but I just, I agree with Tom, what you're asking is like a pay-as-you-throw assessment. Um, I... I think what I'm hearing from you but is... A that's a policy consideration for us. So I guess I would want direction from what, which things you would like to see pulled out, and I think that would be more of an expenditure line. Um, yes. What you would like to see pulled out of expenditure that you could, instead of having it paid for through the property tax, would be instead paid for through user fees or direct assessment. So is there anything other than... Waste? I would have to go through, I, off the top okay. of my head, I would have to go through whatever we do. Waste is just a big one. I mean, that's, you're talking about, I think it's a $750 million. No, but uh, 1.5. Uh, yeah. yeah. I think we have to be careful of falling into the trap of just because we cut it out of the municipal budget doesn't mean it's, it's not an expense for citizens. I mean, we could be providing a service for X amount of dollars. That service is still necessary. It's still going to have to come out of somebody else's pocket. Um, and how you deal with the ability to pay in a private sector setting like that. You know, and what's the recourse for that? I mean, I'm not, I don't, I'm not, I'm not saying that we don't have to I'm looking at, at the municipal, I really, to be honest with you, I just thought about municipal waste services <laughs> and the discussion that probably um, has happened and may happen again regarding pay as a throw. Uh, that's all I was really thinking about, to be honest. It's a high dollar item it's for us, it's and it's, there's a ready-made solution. It's not politically popular necessarily, but there is a there's a way to shift that cost to a user fee system fairly simply. So um, then we come to this graph, which is general fund expenditures as percent of total assessed value, and this graph also shows a slight increase. Um, which is not considered to be a positive trend. Um, again, though, you get a gray box because it's a very, very slight increase. And it prompted, so, okay, so we've got um, this table right here. So you've got your general purpose aid to education converted into 2017 dollars uh, and a percentage change, which the change from 2008 to 2016 is a negative 37.15% change in GPA. Um, you also have state revenue sharing. That one as a percent change in current dollars is negative 46.63%. Those are really significant. Um, total decrease between 08 and 16 in 2017 dollars, $2.7 million in general purpose aid to education, and three quarters of a million in state revenue sharing. Um, I can only imagine if you guys were to make a budget that suggested an increase in $2.7 million, uh, $2 million in spending, how unpopular that would be, but the result is that that's what you're looking at. It's an increase in needing money to be raised through taxation. So when we look at general fund expenditures as a percent of total assessed value, this is, um, Again, not a positive or a negative trend necessarily. It's another chance to evaluate the cost of providing services and seeing if it's a match for the resident's ability and willingness to pay. A warning trend would be a steady increase over time. Uh, that would suggest that increases in expenditures are outstripping increases in assessed value significantly. Other municipalities may choose to look at expenditures per capita, but this is one of those places that I suggested that we look at assessed value to reflect better our tax base. Um, so I've asked some just questions, and I have not really tried to answer them because I think that they're just open. Does it represent an increased demand for existing services, which is what I think um, Councillor Chiazza was just kind of referring to? Um, are we using user fees appropriately to offset the increased demand, if that's the case? Is the increase a result of an increase in fixed costs, such as health insurance premiums? Um, as 
A service provider's economy lies on a skilled and dedicated workforce, and the percentage of the budget spent on salaries and benefits reflects this. So we would expect to see some increase there. What part of the increase can be attributed to decreases in state aid to education and revenue sharing? The table to the right shows the real dollar effects of decreases in state revenues. Since 2008, the town has seen a decrease of $3,492,971, and that's in current, you know, just for inflation dollars, in revenue from the state total. This represents a 37.15% decrease in general purpose aid and 46.63% decrease in revenue sharing. Um, are the expenditures as a percentage of assessed value rising faster than the revenues as a percentage of assessed value? It would be best if they were not. Um, our trend line, on, you know, does show that our expenditure line is in rate of expenditure increase is slightly higher than our rate of revenue increase. So that is a place to just kind of be aware of. Um, and really, it very, is very likely that once we have hit that rock bottom zero receivership status, we'll be able to better compare year to over year. Um, I suggest that you've already identified a percentage, tax rate percentage increase that is acceptable of 3%. This metric may provide an opportunity to fine tune that. And you might want to look at um, what sort of increases you'd be, that you're willing to sustain in general fund expenditure as a percentage of total assessed value, that that might be a way to tie once things have evened out and you're no longer having to compensate for losses in, in revenue, um, it may be an area to set policy as far as, as tying increases to assessed value. I, I struggle with the assessed value being part of all of this analysis because, it, it, as was mentioned, it's, it, it doesn't suggest someone's ability to pay per, per se. I, I would agree with that. However, um, I'm not sure what other metrics you can use for the analysis. That's the problem. Well, I think, I mean, anecdotally, I, I, <coughs> I think you could use uh, um, um, non payment rates for taxes, foreclosure rates. You could look at the amount of people who are applying for aid that are qualifying for aid for local property tax relief. Mm -hmm. I think we could look at that parameter to say if we hit a certain level that meets the requirements, then okay, then we're pushing that limit a little too high. Um, but I, 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 I'm always cautious to, uh, you know, look at the overall big picture based upon. You have to acknowledge that situation for sure. It's a factor. I don't mm -hmm. know if it's necessarily the driving factor, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I think that I take, I feel comfortable with the total assessed value figure because it's looking at the town as a whole, not as an individual household. So, absolutely agree. The value of one's home does not necessarily reflect the ability of that individual householder to pay those taxes, but that if we are assessing the town's expenditure budget, looking at the town's total assessed value may be a way to create a guideline for council to make decisions. So Larissa, I got a question for yeah. you. So looking at, um, to toggle back, if you want to just go stroll up a little bit. So looking at a trend line, obviously you can look at points in time, and so you were right when you said that we're, we're creeping up to, our, as a percentage, 2.03 is creeping up to the same level as the revenue side, which was 207. However, if you look at the actual trend of where we were in 07 to where we are today, on the expenditure side, we are only 27 basis points change between the two periods. And on the revenue side, um, the change was 35%, if I had did that right. The question I have is, what type of change over time becomes problematic versus when you compare it using two points, you know, within the same uh, kind of time frame? Because to me, a 25 basis points change <coughs> really isn't significant. Sure, I think that that's why this is a gray box, not a, a yellow yeah. or a red. I think that I mean, these are fairly flat lines. Yes. They, but they are trending upward. I, I'm not finding anything that says this is the percentage change over year over year that should raise a red flag. I'm not finding that data. Yeah. I think that this is really a policy discussion for um, to have as far as what council feels comfortable with. And I think that this would be a self-determined place that you would say um, this makes us uncomfortable. And I can see that being in lots of areas. It could be looking at the, um, remember that, that change in revenue line, when we break it out versus property tax versus non-property tax, we get a very different picture. Mm -hmm. So that may be part of the conversation. At, you know, where, are, where is council comfortable with 
at what percent increase in property tax as a percentage of assessed value does is council feel is sustainable mm. and therefore is comfortable mm. taking on? Um, they're really very subtle and very nuanced. And um, But it was, Tom and I had a goodly amount of conversation generated from this one graph yeah. and thinking about what that said. And that is really what led to the breakdown of um, some of those other numbers. Any other questions about this one? Just the, the packet cutoff, quite a few of those. Okay. Um, sure. Sure. And I think that it's also available for you on the SharePoint site under finance. I can't look at that one for some reason. Okay. Look at that text. But or on the iPad. It's we normal. actually shared the Excel spreadsheet, and that, that was the problem with trying to convert this to PDFs was a nightmare. So the Excel spreadsheet is available. Uh, the question is whether the iPad and others will support even viewing uh, the spreadsheet. I think through SharePoint it did not. It may if it was a direct email attachment. Okay, sure. Something, I think going through the SharePoint website has some yeah. problems. Yeah, we, we can share the, uh, the spreadsheet right out. I'll do it before I go home. I prefer that, but I don't so we already really we looked at these, um, and I just wanted to kind of look at the difference between full state valuation versus town assessed value. Um, and I think that one of the things that was most telling when I first created the graph of the full state valuation adjusted for inflation, and we saw that trough. Um, the question was raised, well, how then, like, should we maybe use total assessed value? Would that be a truer figure? So I adjusted for inflation for that as well. And what we see is that we also saw a trough there. You'll see that there's um, some of those negative percent change of total assessed value when we adjust for inflation is in the far right column of that top table. And we still see some negative mm. numbers there. So the town, you know, the the... And I talk about a little bit why we might want to see that. So I started doing some research about what is happening because it, it didn't make sense. It was against, uh, it was counterintuitive. We see the growth. We see the new buildings taking place. We see new businesses coming in. It, this was totally counterintuitive. So I started just trying to research and see if anyone talked about this. And I found this nice little publication out of Wisconsin. Um, and I just kind of captured that one little sentence out of it, but I gave you the link if you wanted to read the whole thing. We typically assume the market value of our property changes with each year's inflation or deflation. Even though there is a new assessment roll every year, most assessors don't review and revalue the assessments yearly. That means in a year without a revaluation, the assessed value does not reflect the property's market value. And I highlight that the last revaluation townwide of Scarborough was in 2005. And while certainly our assessing team does a great job of capturing all of the building permit pickups and if a house sells, adjusting um, for those spots, we are at this point 12 years behind in, t you know, total assessed value. And part of what we're seeing is a reflection of that. Um, just something to be aware of. Is it a fair, is it a fair assumption when I've heard this kind of saying that when you do an evaluation or reassessment, a third of the properties go up in value, a third decrease in value, a third stays down? So would we really expect what what like said, what kind of valuation adjustment could we expect to the full valuation adjustment? Uh, based on our quality rating, our final numbers are pretty good, and therefore I expect our total value is not going to change much. There's going to be reshuffling, and that's a hallmark of valuation is is fairness, obviously in equity. Um, yeah, our final numbers are pretty darn spot on, and that's because we do annual sales analysis and adjust accordingly. You know, this town is big and diverse, and condos are different than single family from waterfront to backland. So you need to really understand those different nuances and adjust accordingly. We have years where we some go up and some go down, and but the building blocks that come up to that value are out of whack. We've not been in these homes for 10 or 12 years, and so you're probably making up that difference on the land value essentially. <coughs> but I would not expect a huge change in the overall assessed value is just to how it's shared. <coughs> Excuse me. And then we already talked about these ones, which is just that kind of comparison with the other towns. Mm -hmm. And I really think that that's about it. Um, I give it a green light on those. The just, again, reflecting the resiliency and the ability to recover. Oh, great job. Thanks. So 
we, we really look for your input in terms of the commentary that's provided, the questions asked, the colors assigned. Uh, there's no, there's nothing magical here. Um, you've tasked Larissa, and I think she's done a great job to get us to this point, but we do need some feedback as to whether you agree with the assessment that's been given. And we certainly don't expect that this evening. That can be an ongoing conversation. Yeah, well, I was going to ask the uh, probably. Oh, that's much better. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess I guess formally. Thank you. I mean, I was, that was a, been a lot of analysis to put a lot of stuff on the table. Um, we as a committee, though, I'm just kind of looking to both your input. I know that we're going to be kind of tied up with budget stuff from now until, until June. Um, and, and, Sean, I guess I kind of look for you particularly and kind of you, you've kind of started the conversation <coughs> around metrics and wanting to get to a better place where we can start looking at stuff. You know, it seemed to me, Tom, to answer your question that a lot of the, the sort of the benchmarks you've already come up with seems to me to be like a great starting point. Yep. Um, and we're going to have, we've had some events like Wentworth. We, as we come through this budget season, we're going to know some of our decisions. Um, so, so is it the will of this group? Should we say that these seem to, to fit the mark for now? We'll come back to this maybe late summer after the budget's put to rest and maybe give some more guidance yep. to, to Tom and in is that, anybody have any comments, thoughts? Um, so first, thank you. <laughs> this is, um, you know, for two years we've been talking about getting to this particular point, um, and this is a really great start, um, if not a start and a midpoint for us. Um, the only thing I would ask um, is, um, I think for communications, this is a lot of information for uh, the general public or even maybe some town councils who aren't, they don't have the financial or statistical acumen is to do an executive summary page that might highlight um, the most important graph within each one of those and then um, maybe the same narrative and then we can come up with recommendations on maybe where the council finance committee wants to because I've in my head with your conversation I think there's a lot of potential policy goals yeah. that we can already start having a conversation and that those could be um, the highlights of each one of those sections um, I'm not saying that don't provide the data behind it. I'm just saying if we can summarize it into a summary, I think that would be a really good um, kind of report that can be, because these metrics, you're not going to measure them half a year. You're going to measure them at the end of the year. Okay. Yeah, <coughs> this is great for us to get started with the next cycle. So um, that's kind of how I'm kind of viewing where this goes. And I think that I kind of want to sit down and think about whether there's anything else that we'd want to take a look at that might be important as well as get feedback from others. Um, but I think that this is a great start that we could, once this summary is completed, we could forward it to the council as a whole and give a brief summary at the highest level for them. So, John, I know one of your goals across all things you're doing is for continuity year over year. Yep. This esteemed group of finance committee members won't be assembled forever, um, maybe as soon as next year. Uh, so it's important at some point when it would be great to have a, the committee take some action and maybe even the council endorsed that these are the metrics we think are important. And that will just be a clear indication to staff that this is what we're going to measure and look at year over year. And we'll come into a routine whereby we bring to future finance committees this material on a consistent basis. It also gives us an opportunity to demonstrate to the credit agencies uh, that we've got some method of madness, that uh, we are paying attention to this stuff. And that I can't tell you how important it is for them to. Um, for us to be able to demonstrate that there's consistency over time. Mm -hmm. So, so what I, if you know, um, so what I was um, kind of kind of thinking through this uh, out loud is that the summary could also uh, provide policy direction where we want to go because that is really what we're going to measure, um, or that I'm sorry, that's how we're going to use this data in driving the work that we have. So whether it's relooking at fund balance policy and expanding it to the other areas mm -hmm. that they talked about as a percent of revenue and expenditures and whatever that might be because then we can use that, you know, to determine whether we've been successful as a committee in drafting those policies and forwarding them to the council. 
So my take on this is um, excellent work. I mean, it's incredibly comprehensive. It's, it's a great data set. Um, it at least gives us a much better analysis, I think, than we've, I, I certainly have ever seen from this type of information as opposed to grabbing, grabbing it and trying to assemble it um, piecemeal. Um, I, I'm always cautious, though, about, yeah, I know you're sorry, you're right. about making this a policy without giving it time to mm -hmm. really sink in and see, because the, the budget as a whole is in flux in as we kind of a, a stabilize our state funding levels and things like that and we get to a, a little bit more stable situation, which I think we're going to get there whether we want to or not. I'm, I'm always cautious about making policy now based on the data here moving forward when we've got maybe another year or two of trending data that would really impact how we adjust fund balance usage because we may have to use more now to make the difference up mm -hmm. until we kind of graduate up. How quickly do we want to get to a certain level? You know, uh, all of that stuff. So I think these metrics are great to start with. I, I, I would suggest we, you know, we adopt them um, as a metrics to measure with the understanding that maybe we're not setting policy directly off of this right now, um, but with an eye towards, you know, yeah. in, in a year or two coming back again and charging whoever's here to, uh, it may be us, it may, <laughs> it may not be, but charging whoever else is to kind of reevaluate and assess that for a couple of years to see are these metrics really doing and measuring what we want and then we can use those as a basis for, for policy. It's a great tool, um, but I think we have other tools too that we, that we should be using too for policy. So, so I, I like the form, I, I, well, the, I mean the format we can adjust for single, you know, mm -hmm. executive summary or however it is. Um, but the inputs, once you've done all the heavy lifting on the back end, you just plug the numbers in and it all should be spitting out I would assume year, year to year, whatever we punch sure. in for numbers. Um, so I'm, I'm content with this. I, I, I think it's great work. Um, so I, I'd say, yeah, we'll give it a test run for a little while and see, see what comes out of it. My only, my only reservation is that I would not want to wait two years. And the reason is because we've seen, um, just only one year, slightly longer than when Chris joined us, we've had uh, policies or data that's been given to us and we said, let's wait and see if we can apply this to the, without making it a policy. Um, see if we can apply it and what do we learn and it just fell through the, it just fell through the kind of the gaps and we never you know capital planning was one of them mm -hmm. you know we never really fully looked at it so as long as it stays at the forefront we stay committed to it um, absolutely you know we can use <coughs> the back up of our uh, you know this committee's recommendation uh, personally I don't think there's anything wrong because one thing we've learned from council to council is that anything can change and the next council can completely <laughs> change what this committee just did yeah, I, I see this as kind of incremental. I think uh, adopting them as metrics to pay attention to is a first step, uh, not necessarily making policy decisions yet. If there were red indicators on this page, we might have a different conversation, but I don't think we're in kind of any kind of danger zone whatsoever. Uh, so that might be a, another way to approach it is kind of ease into it, but not making any long-term policy decisions yet. Although I guess my only two cents are kind of listening to both of you. Um, I, mean, see, I, I mean, I think it's great work, and it, it does move us forward. Whether this group would be comfortable saying, "Okay, let's, you know, let's work green," we'll, these, these are the right sort of start. But maybe just put on our agenda to come back, and once we get through the budget process, and we understand where we are, because who knows, everything's in flux with funding and other stuff. And then at least put it on our table if there are some policy considerations that do make sense, that we we kind of advance that agenda before our terms expire. Yes. Yep. Um, and, and have that conversation in sort of the summer time frame. Does that, does that work for everybody? Yep. I mean, once the budget's approved, we'll be, we'll be able to make at least a projection for the year because we've made yes. a decision yes. and we can look. Um, I mean, with 10 years of data, the next 10 years really is, I don't think, could be too much different if you wait that much longer. So I, absolutely. Let's we'll get through the budget and then use the budget information to yep. see what the change impact is. And then go for it. Absolutely, I think it's fine. Yeah, w without dis disparaging any past finance committee members, uh, I think Ruth would agree with me. There's more interest and more kind of horsepower among this assembled group than I've had a, any year during my tenure here. And that's again no slight on any past committee members. So putting your stamp on it and kind of assuring this, uh, of course, a future committee could do something different if they choose. Yeah. But setting a course, I think, is important before you disband. So summer, late summer, early fall, sometime before the end of the year. So is there any comfort with that? Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. That's Do we need a motion? motion? I think we're, we're good, I think. I, I think we're good. I mean, it's not a, not well, not, yeah, I think, I don't know. What do you think? I don't I mean, think it, I, I think that once uh, we can wait for yeah. 
Larry said to complete uh, you know, the presentation for a package and uh, you know, maybe she can just distribute it. We can then, you know, through the chair, recommend, take recommend action, it become yeah. part of the formal. It will be the uh, report to the full board of what we intend to do. And, and I think, you know, I like your suggestion of an executive summary. And then I think you've done a great job, though, of kind of just teasing out what some of the policy parameters might be. Okay. I think just having that included is kind of just get it on the radar screen, because especially if we are going to come back toward the tail end of our, of our cycle. At least it's kind of on the full council screen that these are some things that are just without any, anything formal. Yeah, well, but, but here are some policy things to start thinking about. And I perfectly expect, from my personal perspective, to use this data as we formulate this mm -hmm. year's budget. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I, I just, I'm always hesitant. I mean, it's information. It's here. I, I believe it. It's accurate. Um, I, it's, I, I'll, I will certainly use that in helping evaluate and establish. I'm always just leery, like I said, of establishing a formal policy without giving it time to, yeah. to, to, to work itself through. But I, I agree wholeheartedly. I mean, coming back in, in, in the summer, um, and then we take a formal action after we get through it and say, okay, this is what we want to adopt moving forward and, okay. and go from there. Great. Great. Thank you. Um, the, next, the next item on the agenda was just, just a discussion of, of 2017 priorities. One of them is just a brief update and, um, on the budget process and where we are. There are a couple critical dates coming up. On April 5th will be the first time that the joint budgets are kind of presented out to the full council. So for folks that are viewing from home and in the audience, that might be something you're interested in. That's the first time we kind of see where we are. And then on the 6th, um, actually, we start our uh, formal work of starting to listen to the individual budgets of, of the municipalities by department and start going through their budget. So those are sort of where we are in the budget process. As an update, the, the joint um, town council and board of education joint finance committees have been meeting. We've had lots of conversations preliminary about what some of the budget drivers are. We've had conversations about what we're going to do about a goal that we'll talk a little bit about and what the town council adopted last week as our goals is trying to really continue to focus on communication and doing a better job of communicating the budgets and where we are and that type of thing. So we've been having lots of discussions about how can we do a better job of getting the information out and get people engaged. I don't know if any of you have anything to kind of add to the budget process. Well, no, I, if you wanted to share the times or for the sixth meeting of the sixth, because that's that's different outside of our normal. Uh, those are that's that's what that. Yep. That's, yeah. So yep. maybe maybe just because it's not our normal meeting hours, right? Well, it'd be yeah. April the different days, the same hour. Same, same hour. hour. Okay. So we're we're back to the six p.m. meeting. Yes. Okay. Yep. All right. Essentially every Thursday in April. Okay. Six p.m. Okay. Is the gang's all here? Yeah. That's right. Okay. <laughs> Good. And, 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 and the website does a really good job, the town website does a really good job of kind of outlining dates and times and things. I, only because of the attention, I would mention uh, the time that the school is presenting because it's such a big focus. Because um, it's only right there. 13th. I believe it's um, oh, oh, on the 13th. Only because it's the, it's the second largest focus, or maybe yeah, the, okay. the largest yeah. focus. Yeah. So that's on uh, Thursday, April 13th from 6.30 to 7.30, which will be live live telecasted, but also open, so. Anything else? Anybody? Anybody? Um, the next thing we talked about a little bit. Peter, could we just type, uh, use the opportunity, the platform? Uh, we do have a very short uh, survey up on the town website, oh, right. and we publicized it through various channels today uh, regarding the budget form. It was conversation at the last joint meeting about has it worked, is there ways to approve it, so we thought we'd, we'd test the waters. Um, We'll, I'm not sure how long we'll keep that up because if there's a going to be a change, we need to know that fairly soon so we can course correct. But um, anyway, if people have opinions, by all means, weigh in. And it, yeah, on the website, it pops up as a pop-up. So if you go to the website, it pops right up at you, and you can um, tell it which if you want to fill it out or if you're all set, thanks. And then it's also in the news feed on the website, so you can link onto it that way. It's also on Facebook. The minute you hit it, it takes you right to the survey. It was great. <laughs> I answered the survey five times. on the Board of Education <laughs> website, too. And thank you for doing that. That's okay. a great job. It's really, it's just ask good. if the budget good. form is working, whether people would like to see some changes. We had talked about is, is it worthwhile trying to do some smaller meetings with maybe, you know, presentations or, or attendance by both Board of Education and Town Council members. So. 
uh, Finance Committee members. So let us know what, what you're thinking. Thank you. Um, with that, another, another goal item we had was to start thinking about reformatting our financial statements. Um, we kind of started this conversation last time, included in the packet or on the site were just some some information. I think one of the things we'd ask for you, but I think it was Sean's idea, was just kind of an executive summary, kind of a one pager about what's happening, sort of. And I think the way you phrased it, Sean, is you know, where's what's positive, what's negative. Yep. Um, what you see in your packet is just a real first attempt. Um, so I don't know if, if both of you have had a chance to kind of go through it and have any thoughts. Um, so that was sort of the executive summary. We've made some changes to just um, the individual sheets. Um, on just the balance sheet, we just included a variance column. So instead of having to calculate in your head as you go down and you look at the changes in fund balance, it, the, the variance is so the right hand column we kind of added. Um, just makes it easier to kind of, if anything sticks out. Um, we went through and really not a lot of changes, just cleaned up. We eliminated a lot of the old exhibits had dollars and cents on them, and we just kind of rounded to the whole the whole number. Great. Um, Ruth, just a quick question. I, I noticed on these ones that you reworked, your comments along the bottom kind of dropped off, but those were always very helpful. On, on the old ones, you kind of had like footnotes somewhere. Foot, yeah. Footnotes. Yeah. The footnotes. I can put those back in. I only took them out because I thought that was yep. this was going to replace it, but I can put them back. Well, I think I think this is great. I mean, I, I look at your first page as being like a thirty thousand mile view. Anything that's just really you really want to draw our attention to. Mm -hmm. I think some of your footnotes were really helpful in just answering questions as we went through. I don't know how. Yeah. No, no, no I, I, I agree with that. Yeah. I agree. With that. Um, and I, you know, I think the only other big change that we took out is on the page four. And Ruth, you can maybe walk me through this. You used to have a column that that had the numbers, but then had the incumbences a, as a different line item, which are potential future line something you know we've spent money on, but it hasn't come in yet. Correct. Um, and just for ease of presentation, we made a recommend recommendation maybe to take those out. But those are I think we uh, have to check back, but I, we either took them out or we combined them. <coughs> well, you combined because them. they were going to be yep. okay. pretty well. They weren't going to change that much from what was yep. encumbered. So does anybody have yeah, any, guys, so any comments or thoughts or uh, on the right track? Yeah, so um, my eyesight is really bad with these pages because of the print, I think, um, or I'm just getting old. Uh, <laughs> you said there was a variance line? Where, where oh, just, just, just on the... I guess all I did is I just on, on the balance sheet. Oh, on the balance. Because I, I mean, I, the thing I always looked at is like, hey, what's, what's happened to fund Oh, I did. So one page I didn't look at. Okay. So <coughs> it just introduces just so you can kind of quickly go. Yeah. If it's too confusing, it doesn't. So the other question I had was that we received a uh, comment um, via email from a, uh, from a citizen regarding uh, projections uh, for the remainder, in essence, for the remainder of the year. Am I explaining this right? I think those were really two different, different comments. Two different. Different. Yeah. Projections were year-end projections in the budget presentation. The and other one is the, the yeah. variance column. Oh, it was only for the budget presentation. Okay. Well, we could add a variance column between. No, so instead fine. of just percentage use, we could do a dollar amount change. I always. No. I always understand. I'm okay. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Um, I always. I just wanted to make sure I understood because my understanding was that the actual budget amount is your projection because we're a zero net budget. We don't budget for surpluses, so you expect to expend 100% as well as you expect 100% of your revenue. So there's really no need for. A, I just want to make sure I understood. Okay. Yeah, and, and, and on the on the counts on the uh, the second one with the 2018 budget, I we we currently do that. I'm not. I, don't, I was going to look and check and see if the school did, but I I don't remember. But um, it's a matter of real estate. For my proposed budget, we do include your own projection. Um, However, when, once it's done and adopted, we often drop that and we favor uh, another actual, you know, it's a matter of real estate on the page. Um, but always in my presentation will be projected year end. Yes, yeah, so there really were two questions that kind of broke out. One was in the budget process to have that in both the municipal and, 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 school. Yeah, and school budget. Um, and so you've answered the question about the municipal side. I think we have the question to ask on, on the school side and so we'll have that conversation and see. Um, and then I think the other question really was when we do the quarterly statements, as I understood it, was really trying to compare the expenditure for this quarter versus the same quarter last year. And that, that does take up more real estate. And 
So I, I know, so we can. Well, this okay. is, we, we only give the reports out quarterly, but they're for the, the whole period, whatever it yeah. is. And yeah. we do provide that analysis okay. from current year to the same time last year. So. Um, that was a recent ad last year, I think. We yeah. asked yeah. for that. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. okay. Good. So, comfortable with this for sort of yeah, next run through and if we identify yeah. anything we want changed, we can, yeah. again, it's the 50,000 foot view here. This is just kind of giving us a trend and identifying areas that we have to look at more intently if something's going awry. Yeah. Um, as long as there are triggers there for us to identify something to start the discussion, I'm, I'm comfortable with it. It's fine. Okay. Um, I think the next next conversation was really, you know, was just kind of adopt, adoption dashboard metrics, but we really kind of just had that, and we, I, think, I think we can kind of put that, we'll put that down to the summer agenda. Um, you know, and I think the, the long-term planning model is just, we had had this on our agenda, I mean, a couple times we've talked about it, and this is just another one where we're thinking about, you know, especially as we're looking ahead, as we talk about, you know, minimum funding, potentially a public safety building, other things we know are coming, and at some point in the cycle, are we, can we get, have you got, oh, you're just turning that off? Yeah. I thought you had something. No, <laughs> no, no. no. no I'm sorry. Um, I, can't, I can't anticipate that well. Sorry. <laughs> so, so I think what we want to try to move to, and I, this is just a placeholder to make sure you guys, you know, see what you're thinking until we come back to it later, is, is really starting to look at a longer term planning process to look at what we're planning to do, what that might have, the impact on the tax rate and other things, and that would be really helpful to kind of get into Q2 to start keying up. So, Marissa's that's a lot actually priority for you guys. Do you guys agree with that? And we actually have used the long range facility plan. Now, it doesn't include the schools component yet, for the, but for the town, we've yeah. actually layered in uh, based on those projects, uh, worked with our bond advisor, and actually have amortization schedules that show all of that debt being taken on at you know, the projected timelines. There's a lot of assumptions built into that, mind you, but we have a very good handle on what that model could look like already. And staggering, too, with an eye in those tables, it shows debt service each year and, uh, and working to stagger those projects in to try to keep that debt service level. level. That annual debt service, keeping it as steady as possible so we don't have the ups and downs. So this really, I'm sorry, Trump. No, no, go ahead. There's really two attributes to that. One is, I think, as we just came through our process talking about how that affects bond ratings and those types of things, it's important. Mm -hmm. But the other piece of this, too, is if, if we continue to have our goals of having sustainable tax rates and predicting them, also trying to do some calculations about, you know, when to layer in these other things that we're doing, what impact it's going to have, the potential use of fund balance, and how do we look forward at that? Because I think this year in particular is going to be important as we look down the pike. Um, what's that going to look like? So, just wanted to kind of get it. If, if you guys think it's important, kind of get it on the agenda and something we can come back and visit. So, um, I agree, and I think it needs to stay a priority. The question is, how big of a bite do we take into this process? For me, I think that given the current position that we're in, um, if we start looking at a three-year, uh, three-year plan, yeah. um, that would be a good start. Of with an eventual goal that you maybe look at three, five, and seven, or you do something a little bit more, because you have to get through kind of the comfort stages of what you're doing. The reason is that um, we're not 100% certain yet where we are on the minimal receivership position. Once we are at minimal receivership, absolutely, I say go full force, and you can do a three, five plan. Until we get to that point, it's going to be very hard, and it will require a lot of going back um, to kind of fix that plan to see what we actually get. So um, now, if we want to go forward, even with that uncertainty, if we want to go forward and plan based upon minimal receivership and just completely disregard what the state is going to provide to us, um, I'm okay with that too, as long as that's the position in the sand, the line was drawn, and then we all going to stick to that and not use as part of that argument, well, but we did get $200,000 more this year. It doesn't matter from a planning perspective because you need to be able to have that benchmark and say. So I just think there needs to be, and then, you know, um, we need to also be careful um, because we don't know where we're going with the state. Um, you know, we need to make sure that we roll out a long-range plan, fiscal long-range plan, very carefully for for the on the communication side with the public. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to because it's going to be extremely sensitive. 
There's a lot, sorry, because there is a lot of assumptions. Yeah, there are some things that we can uh, estimate. You know, debt service, we know what we're taking on. We can plan what, but there's a lot of things you just don't know. We don't know when the market's going to react negatively and our valuation's going to go down. You're not going to know on so many other, you know, so things can change. And that's where the dissemination, you know, look what's happening in today's world when, you know, you make one comment and then the President of the United States makes a totally different <laughs> comment. And we don't want to get in that situation on our finances. We did suspend your Twitter account, didn't we? <laughs> you did suspend my Twitter account. Um, so I, I guess I'm, and surprise, surprise, I'm kind of in the middle. I mean, I think it depends on what we're doing. Um, I think long-range facilities planning is a great opportunity to, to do some real hardcore long-range planning. I would love to see us, I've said it before, I'd love to see us as a town adopt a facilities maintenance plan similar to what the schools have done with the evaluation of all the existing facilities, projecting out oper maintenance costs, operational costs, um, and then meshing those two together because at, at some level, at some form, um, just so that we can kind of look at the big picture trend, yeah. you know, fairly, fairly consistently. Um, I think when we're looking at, um, you know, some of our fixed costs, like labor and things like that, we can start to get some kind of long range planning uh, or, or try to get some kind of handle on, on projections or how we're, you know, we're going to track that stuff. Um, but I think to, 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 to Sean's point of, you know, there's so many intangibles that we deal with from year to year. We just, we're not, you know, we, we can make all kinds of assumptions and spend a lot of staff time and a lot of effort trying to project the way something's going to go, and one factor can throw that whole thing out the yeah, window. Yeah, so health benefits. Right, uh, right. So yeah. I, I think if we, you know, from, I, I'd like to see a, I, I agree with you, we, we need to put that in the wheelhouse so we can get an understanding of it, maybe not get definitive fixed firm, Right. Dollar right. values and, and, and hard numbers, but, but to say, okay, you know, we're, we, we know we're going to have X amount of debt retired in so many years, so, and we started to do it with capital. What's, what's, the, what's the three, five, seven year plan for capital investment in town? It's, and how do we, and we're starting we to do that. model that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right, right. So, I, but I agree, I think, you know, as, as much of that as we can solidify and make a policy, I think that's, that, uh, that I, would, I would certainly welcome that. Um, as long as we're not trying to like look at total budgets, you know, in two, three, five. I'd love to get there, but I think again, to Sean's point, until we can stabilize more of the variables, I think it's very to be very difficult for us to, to, to predict where we're going to be in a year, two, or three, yeah. or five. You know. But, but I was almost thinking, is, is there any value? So if, if we can make some assumptions about what the valuation is going to do, mm -hmm. we did some work on that last year yep. around how to get there. It's just e even the relationship between saying, okay, if the overall town budget is at 5%, what does that do to, to the potential tax rate? I mean, at what rate? And it's sort of, you started to touch on some of those things. We know where our expenditures are and you know where the, the values are going if you want to maintain a 3% overall rate. What does that say about where the whole expenditure line needs to come in as a town budget? Mm -hmm. is, it, is it 5%? Is it... Seven, so at least as we start the process, we start to get, and then, and then you can layer into that, and again, I, you shouldn't have to burn a whole lot of staff time, but then when you have a big debt service that's going to hit, if, it, if it's not that level plane that you're talking about, and I don't know if that's an impossible, just you'll burn a ton of resources to kind of just get to a predictor model, but I was trying to just get a handle on what does a 6% overall budget increase translate to a, as an effective tax rate that we might need. So, so how do we kind of, that just helps I think in the planning process up front. So just, just a thought, I, I don't know no, um, that's uh, worth uh, taking a stab at. If I'm uh, listening properly, I think that we're all in the same position. We might be getting at it at a different angle because I was purely looking at it from a total budget. I wasn't, but then again, to look at a total budget, you assume that you then go through the same process for the sub, subsections of that, whether it's facilities, uh, labor relations, whatever it might be. Um, you know, one of the things that needs to be acknowledged and at some point is, and this is going to be the hard conversation about any trends and, tr and metrics, is there's going to be another recession and we can all have our predictions and we need to acknowledge that in our planning because it's, I think it's going to happen sooner than people think. Um, and that's why I'm okay with, you know, wanting to do a three year because it could be within the next three years. I mean, the cycle is almost perfect for it to start happening probably in two. Um, and, and I shouldn't say a recession because that's a little bit longer term. You'll have a downtick in the economy that's going to impact everything that we're dealing with. And you need to kind of do what is your best 
estimate, and then what is your more yeah. Um, yeah. cautious estimate um, as a result of some of those indicators? Because there's indications out there that are already starting that within 24 to 36 months you could see some changes. And, and again, I, I, I mean, I, I like the concept. My concern is to, to some of the stuff that Larissa put together. You look at we're our own, you know, 60% of our revenue is property tax, but there's still 40% other out there mm -hmm. intergovernmental yeah. revenue, excise taxes that are not stable or predictable. And right now they're trending up. That's fantastic. I'd be very cautious to base our long-term operating budgets on projected excise tax revenue yeah. constantly going up or even staying yeah. flat. I mean, that's another one of those variables that is totally related to where the first thing goes. It's the first thing that goes down. Right. So, so I think, so that, that was kind of to my point of saying, you know, in areas I think that we, we, we can identify some stability and we can identify some, some, some inherent long-term impact, you know, certainly debt service, facilities management, labor, some of the things yeah. that I mentioned before. I think we, we, we should be looking at those things. I don't know if we'll, ca I, I, I think we, many times groups have tried to capture 100% of that. No, no. And, and, and you know, 20. yeah, right, or even 60, yeah. 40. I mean, depending on yeah, how yeah. volatile yeah. it is. So I think the more we can stabilize, the better off we'll be. Um, you know, so I, 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 I think we can, you know, again, I don't want to be the naysayer, but slow and incremental steps of looking at stuff that we can okay. clearly identify as, as things that we can generally predict within a, you know, a, a certain percentage of variance or something, you know. Was that as clear as mud, Tom? On <laughs> I don't know, I, I, I'm anxious to have the school kind of uh, get back to us with a little more clarity on their long-term facility needs. Yes. Um, they're likely to be quite expensive, uh, just by the nature of them. I mean, it's no fault of theirs, right. really. Um, so it, I'm anxious to layer that in so we can actually get a full picture. And I know, for good reason, they're taking their time and haven't provided that clarity yet. So I'm anxious to get it, frankly. The, the curious thing about that is that um, the big debt will be voter approved. Uh, I don't know if there's any comfort in that, but as soon as we start testing the water with those referendum questions, we'll probably have a pretty good sense of what the appetite is. So personally, I think that there's a lot of comfort in the fact that it's voter approved. Right. Yeah, but I think to Tom's point is we, we may have this in our wheelhouse for yeah. next year, a year out, two years out, and the town might say, sorry, no. Yeah. <laughs> sure. we're, I mean, not, we're not there. The one thing you, you do control is when it goes to them, right. and right. that's the right. piece that I think we need to be mindful of. And uh, it's important not to you know, bring certain projects up front at the detriment of ones that come behind it. We, need, right. we have needs we've identified, and uh, we're not making a qualification as to what's more important than others. Some are more pressing than others, but they're all important that we've identified. So we need to find a way to manage those over time and not break the bank. Right. So maybe if, if it's like this group is maybe think about, so we've got some things teed up for summer. The, the budget's going to be the next priority, but maybe we can circle back to this in the summer and you guys can have some thought about Already. what we might be able to develop that at least starts to give us a better dock ward or it, we, you're right. It's, it's not going to be perfect, but at least right. I'd just be—I'd just be—I'd love to understand the relationship between overall budget increase to what that does to tax rate, what's sort of in the ballpark, what's not, and whatever. Um, then the, the the next agenda item was just—we had talked about we kind of just roll forward the goals from last year for the finance committee this year. We just adopted new goals, and Sean had done a lot of great work about the, the town council kind of adopted it goals. There were kind of three major goals, but one relates directly to the finance group, I guess, which is us. Um, and so I just wanted to open a conversation. It seems to me that we should probably think about adopting those as our as our goals. I mean, if they seem to be pretty, so. pretty, yeah. you know, pretty inclusive, they kind of covers all the bases, and we will be busy. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if we can three one thought is on that, but yeah, I mean it's consistent. I think that you can we could come up with some subtext that we can set for ourselves that supports the final outcome. Um, so you know, as an example, on the increase in communications, while it doesn't specifically state here um, how we do that, you've addressed that as part of the survey that has gone out, and which we changed the joint presentation. So. As long as I think that you know those actions will support the final outcome, and we can maybe in our um, summary at the end of the year, we'll include that kind of as an example. Here are the things that we did do that are specific. I did want to recommend, um, and I, you know, I don't think I need to ask to reapprove this, but 
Uh, the last goal, which is improving data availability used to inform decision making, it says distribute quarterly trend reports. I think based on the presentation, that would be an annual report. So um, I would recommend that we just ask to ch clerically change that. And I did want to mention that on the increasing the communications piece, even though this focuses a lot on communication planning, um, several counselors said in this process that they really wanted to emphasize the added value or the value added um, of our new employees, the two new hires from last year. And I think that the presentation that was given tonight is a significant step forward in that. So what I wanted to ask of this committee was two things. One is um, when would it be appropriate or when it, what it would be your recommendation on how to communicate that value added for uh, the assistant manager in the presentation we just got. And then also on the second item, there was a recommendation by one council that was included was to bring in expertise on how to understand municipal budgets um, and how they're structured. So working through the chair and maybe you know, the chair and Larissa and Ruth and Tom is to find a resource that we could do a workshop around those two. Maybe we do it at the same time, you know, whatever it might be. What's the audience? Yeah. The elected officials council. or council? Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and depending on what we decide, you know, nothing says we couldn't invite our friends from neighbors. Uh, you know, if we get a state level expert on municipal budgeting, invite, you know, other municipal elected officials from Gorham, whoever, if they'd like, you know. but. Most of the resources through MMA are geared toward much smaller communities that have a, a lesser level of, yeah. some don't even have full-time staff for that matter. So I think one of our challenges might be to find the right person that can offer right. a presentation appropriate to our needs. Um, that's not to say they don't ex exist, but MMA is probably not the right resource for that. Oh, Muskie but GP Cog, anything? Mm -hmm. Perhaps we can, we can search around. Yeah. Muskie yeah. School is Muskie probably another good one. Yeah, I mean, I guess in terms of recommending for value added, um, you know, part of the budget last year was that we said we would need to evaluate their, the payback on those. And I think, I mean, it's, unless staff has objections to that, and it might be part of the budget uh, presentation this year to say, you know, part of the check-in. Um, I, I mean, I, again, I don't want to, I don't want to add work to it, but that's what <coughs> we're no, talking we, about. I think we can. Just keep in mind, uh, these positions were funded starting October 1st, so we're still ramping up. Um, but I. We'll pay some attention to providing some. That's really a committee level report, I think. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm fully confident based on the the interaction so far that yeah. that the return on the investment is will be if it hasn't come to fruition, it's going to be a very short window. Yep. For sure. <laughs> You're still under probation period. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> you oh, oh, it doesn't mean we're going to decide. It, it doesn't mean we're going to continue. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's crap. Were you proposing that those get added to our goals, or were no, no, sort of it's separate, it's separate, separate items? No, they're already no, they would be part of because they're already included. Yeah. Um, I'm just so if you remember, I only included these two, but there are other pieces. All I'm asking is that if I get direction from the committee or the chair, um, when it would be great to have a workshop oh, that focuses yep. on the added value of this position, as mm -hmm. well as to talk about how to understand municipal budgets and bringing in a resource to educate the rest of the council. Because okay. that will help gotcha. achieve gotcha. this goal partially, but more so the bigger goal of the council. Okay. If you don't mind. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's great. I, I'm not, on that second one, I'm not, I'm quite sure actually that we can't do that before this budget is launched and you're fully engaged. Oh, I, I, I'm not saying it needs to be done now. I'm just saying it needs to be done before December. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I mean, we adopted them at the council level. Yeah. I think I'm comfortable with them. Um, I think you know, we'll, we'll, our action items are going to be just par for course for the normal operation of this committee, yeah. and we'll feed into that. And, uh, you know, we're always keeping our goals in mind when we work towards yeah. that stuff anyway. So I don't, I don't feel the need to have to add anything. I think we'll, we'll, our, our normal through our normal operations, I think we'll accomplish. We'll get there. We'll get there yeah. yeah. So I guess it's a motion to approve if you guys are. I'll motion. Yeah. Second. All in favor? Okay. Um, the only other item is kind of, um, I think our agendas are going to be pretty full for the next month or so. So I was going to ask for agenda items, but I think, I think we're good. I think we got, I think we got that kind of, yeah. Um, and so with that, um, again, I open it up to public comment for. <laughs> Right. Die hard. <laughs> Die hard. Yeah. And if you've got anything, that's great. If not, <laughs> um, 
Okay, sure. Okay. See, I knew, I knew you would. Oh, Larry Hartwell, Nine Period and Drive. Um, I think the presentation was great tonight. The the information that she presented is is very useful, useful data. I kind of was at it from six ways to Sunday. I think I think that's that's great, and and the more information you have, the better decisions you can make. Um, on the front end of the process, you know, the front end being what, how much money are we going to raise this year? Uh, you've heard me speak of this before that I don't like us going at it from a mill rate perspective. I, I still don't really understand why we don't say, okay, we spent a hundred million dollars last year and we'll have a three percent increase on that, which would be three million dollars. Uh, like we do household budgets or a business runs that way of uh, actually looking at what you spent last year and how much c can you afford this year. Um, and so it kind of gets lost when we do the mill rate. It shows the mill rate is certainly going to be a lower percentage than, than the dollar increase. And the mill rate is, is also uh, decreased because we're, uh, we've been very fortunate to have valuations of increasing by, I think, $50 million a year, which adds almost $800,000 of revenue uh, to the town without a change in the in the tax rate. So I, I still just don't understand that, and I don't know if you gentlemen would like to speak to that or not. Thank you. No, great point. Thanks. <coughs> Anybody comments or no? So without a motion to adjourn, I guess? Oh, actually, can I make your statement? Yeah. You don't mind? So um, I just wanted to, because we don't have council comments or member comments. So I wanted to thank, uh, again, thank Larissa for the presentation, you know. Um, Having been around as long as I do, I also have a pretty large family, and so family, friends, so this whole work. So, you know, I've had a chance to talk to, I have friends that are on the council in Gorham, Wyndham, uh, Falmouth. I also have family on, on uh, councils in Bath, West Bath, and other areas. And I got to tell you, um, we are, because of you, we are far ahead of the game. Other communities, even with bigger purses, are not taking this approach and not getting ahead of the curve. And I think that. Uh, really wanted to say thank you because this is probably one of the most uh, in-depth um, kind of presentation of data that's really helpful. And just to bring it in perspective, the county is even starting to recognize the value of this type of analysis and is supposed to be undertaking it and they're not um, quite certain, I think, how to do that because I serve as chair of the budget um, for the t county. So I just wanted to say thanks because it's being recognized about the work that we're doing by other communities as well and their need to kind of get along. Uh, uh, come along the same path. So, thank you. Thank you. Great job. Yeah, I guess I would just add that um, you know it, the data is great. It's a great approach. At the end of the day, I think you know we have staff and previous policies to thank that the financial state of the town is very strong. The sky isn't falling. You know, I mean, are there areas of improvement? Of course, there always are. But you know, in the bigger picture thing, we're we're a pretty strong, pretty healthy community, I think, and that's a testament to previous councils and staff and their 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 astute fiscal management. And uh, I, I think we'll continue that and hopefully build on that and and, and make it even better. But I, I, I'm I, it just reiterates to me uh, with the more data that we see yeah. that the, the that this is really kind of a financially healthy and a sound community that does a, a, a very decent job in managing fiscally responsible resources. Thank you. Motion to adjourn. Second. Thank you. Thank you. Get home.